All right. Uh, shalom, everyone. This is the last day of the Sukkot celebration, and I'd like to share with you my perspective on on uh, slavery. It was my understanding that that was one of the primary themes of of your uh, get together this week, and so um, everyone who spoke. I'm sure offered a different take or perspective on that that theme. I believe mine is a unique perspective on it that gives more uh, historical context and clarity. I would like to comment on how, first of all, this is an issue where there are things in the scriptures which people of modern times are uh, have struggles with in their conscience, and one of the one of the big issues that the Yahad has struggled with, or people associated with the Yahad, has been uh, the issue, for example, of eating animals and uh, eating and um, the animal sacrifices and. We know from the Nazarene Acts that there are certain uh, certain statements that are controversial in it about the scriptures being corrupted and, and things of that nature. So I, I mention those things because I think it's very easy to read our modern understanding into the ancient texts. Um, but we got to be careful of that because. Um, to properly understand what the scripture says, we need to approach it from the ancient mindset and not a modern mindset. Modern understanding is important for like, you know, we, we have a lot of science available to us that they didn't have in the past, so that can help us form more accurate understanding. But in many ways, we have a lot less knowledge than the past did because we're missing a lot of things that they had access to. So, um, but one of the big things is the historical context. And so there's plenty of things that in the Bible that conflict with our modern uh, culture and the morality of the world we live in uh, at large. And one of the, one other one of the, big ones is uh, the whole perspective of uh, man and woman and uh, or male and female and in terms of uh, equality of rights or lack thereof. And um, so, but for this specific one, I'm gonna be focusing on, on, on slavery and how I believe that like, a lot of critics of the Bible will tell you that the Bible supports slavery and therefore the Bible is an evil document. But the problem is we filter the, the concept of slavery through the modern experience of slavery. And that is very much connected with the slave trade associated with uh, Europe and and the Americas uh, in these last a few few hundred years ago when when that was going on, and the racial tension that exists still in our society, it stems from the corrupt slavery that we had in the Americas. It was a very racial uh, slavery. The the scriptures, however, the concept of slavery in the scriptures is a very different concept. Um, now there were there were places in the world that had a, a concept of slavery very similar to the modern concept, um, but that concept was was not universal in the societies that did endure slavery. They did not all have the same approach to how to treat their slaves and what what it meant to be a slave. So I'm going to share my perspective of a slave from the Bible perspective, what that truly means. And uh, my perspective on it is that 
it's not necessarily wrong from the <clears throat> from the Bible definition because it's a much clearer, much more uh, acceptable concept when we approach it from what the Bible says about it. So with that said, I'm going to read, uh, I, I prepared a little bit of an outline. Um, first, before I go to the Bible passages, I'd like to go to some of the passages of the ancient writers about the Essenes, because the Ahad tries to model our faith on the Essenes of the past. And I think Jackson has mentioned before how the Essenes of, the, of Philo are an important source that we look to. Uh, the Essenes mentioned by Philo. And, um, and Josephus also mentions the Essenes and shares some parallels with Philo's descriptions. But for the most part, in the specific issue of, of slavery, it's... Uh, more Philo that speaks on the topic than Josephus, although Josephus does touch upon it a little bit. But so I will read uh, a few passages of these historical <coughs> figures. So uh, Philo, in his book of Hypothetica, says. Yeah. All right, so he says, a proof of this is to be found in their life of perfect freedom. No one among them ventures at all to acquire any property, whatever, of his own, neither house, nor slave, nor, nor farm, nor flocks and herds, nor, any, nor anything of any sort which can be looked upon as the fountain or provision of riches. But they bring them together into the middle as a common stock and enjoy one common general common general benefit from all, from it all. So that one passage speaks of how these people living in a community, they shared everything together. And if they're sharing everything together, there's no need for slaves because slavery comes out of poverty and riches. Um, some people being rich and some people being poor. But if everybody's rich, if, you know, if everyone's sharing their riches, then there's no need for slaves, per personal slaves. Then he also says in the same book, he says that um, they avoided, it says, Basically, they tried to avoid marriage. A lot of the Essenes tried to avoid marriage, and that's because um, they felt that a lot of things about marriage was enslaving. Um, instead of being free, you are um, forced by your duties to, to do many things that are uh, contrary to the purpose we've been put here, and that is to... Uh, seek the things of the Creator. So the Essenes were very concerned about following the ways of the Creator, and if anything got in the way of that, they wanted to avoid that. If anything made it harder to follow Ihua, they wanted to avoid that. And one of the things that made it harder is having a family, because a uh, woman had their own wants and desires, just as men want as well, but uh, marriage requires the spouses to attend to each other's desires instead of focusing on, uh, instead of having more free time to focus on Yahuwah's desires. That's something also that Paul said in his opinion. Uh, so that was what the Essene, that was what many Essenes believed. Um, but there were, as we know, there was a group of Essenes who felt that even though marriage was more difficult, that, pe that Essenes just still get married, and some of them did. So, but anyways, that was a, they felt that having a family 
is similar to being a slave. Now, they also said, uh, Philo also said in his book on every good man is free, he said that he again said, there is not a single slave among them, but they are all free, aiding one another with a reciprocal interchange of good offices. And they condemn masters, not only as unjust, inasmuch as they corrupt the very principle of, e of equality, but likewise as impious, because they destroy the ordinances of nature, which generated them all equally, and brought them up like a mother, as if they were all legitimate brethren, not in name only, but in reality and truth. But in their view, this natural relationship of all men to one another has been thrown to disorder by designing covetousness, continually wishing to surpass others in good fortune, <clears throat> and which has therefore engendered alienation instead of affection, and hatred instead of friendship. So, from this passage, it appears that the Essenes opposed, opposed all slavery. But... As I mentioned in the past, they were the different cultures had different concepts of what it meant to be a slave. And Philo was writing from the Greco, uh, the Hellenistic mindset. And so from the Hellenistic concept of slavery or the Roman under concept of slavery, the Essenes were very much against that type of slavery because the Romans and the Greeks, they viewed slaves in a very uh, bad way. Whereas the Hebrew mindset was a, or at least the Bible mindset was a superior and more moral approach to what it meant to be a slave. Uh, so it's my understanding that the Essenes, uh, where, like where, where Philo says that, where he said that they condemn masters as unjust. Um, I don't think they viewed all masters as unjust, but in the masters in the concept of the Greek or Roman understanding is what they were uh, condemning. And then I will quote something from Josephus, which I think lends towards the concept that they didn't condemn all masters. Um, but one more quote from Philo, another book he wrote, on the contemplative life of suppliants. He said, they do not use the ministrations of slaves, looking upon the possession of servants of slaves to be a thing absolutely and wholly contrary to nature, for nature has created all men free, but the injustice and covetousness of some men who prefer inequality, that cause of all evil having subdued some, has given to the more powerful authority over those who are weaker. Accordingly, in this sacred entertainment, there is, as I have said, no slave, but free men minister to the guests, performing the offices of servants, not under compulsion, nor in obedience to any imperious commands, but of their own voluntary free will, with all eagerness and promptitude, anticipating all orders. Uh, so, that, again, is saying a similar thing. Um, I think this is an issue of similar of how there are certain passages that of some writers which make it sound like the Essenes did not accept any animal sacrifices. Uh, but on a deeper surface, uh, when we look more into it, it appears instead that the Essenes did not support the animal sacrifices because the temple system was corrupted by the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees because they, they took over the temple. Their high priest was no longer a legitimate high priesthood and the temple area had been polluted by Herodian alterations. So uh, there, there can be certain statements that make it look like the Essenes absolutely uh, condemned all types of slavery. But there is a passage from Josephus which suggests that they didn't necessarily condemn it uh, universally, but that they condemned that specific type where, this, where having a slave meant that they were 
um, not equal. If having a slave meant they're not equal uh, in their rights or morality, then they uh, oppose that type of slavery. So Josephus, he says this in his 18th book of the Jewish Antiquities. He says... There are about 4,000 men that live in this way and neither marry wives nor are desirous to keep servants as thinking the latter tempts men to be unjust and the former gives the handle to domestic quarrels. Okay, so from Josephus' perspective, he says that a little differently. He says they don't desire to have servants, but he says they do that because they are afraid that having servants tempts men to be unjust. That's it's, it's similar enough to Philo that there seems to be a common tradition, but that Philo makes it more explicit and makes it more, uh, Philo makes it that they think slavery or having servants is unjust always, whereas Josephus says they think it usually is unjust. So Josephus' perspective seems to be more reconcilable with what the scriptures say because scriptures do do support the concept of servants. And we know the Essenes were very much faithful to what the scriptures said. So I don't think they would uh, oppose uh, the concept of having a servant. Uh, absolutely. The same with marriage. They didn't, they didn't oppose marriage and, and having a servant. Uh, absolutely. But they felt that marriage and servitude was very much uh, tempting and can lead to m major injustice and sin. So they preferred to avoid those things. And uh, so, so that's what the ancient writers say about the Essenes. But now I'm going to go from the perspective of what the actual Bible says on the subject. First of all, there are some people who suggest that the Bible teaches uh, indentured servitude and not slavery. Um, however, there is a passage which many overlook, and it's probably it's probably the passage in the Bible that is the most controversial in regards to the issue of slavery because it appears to very much endorse a, a slavery that we're uncomfortable with. So I'm going to read what that says. It's from Leviticus chapter 25 and it reads, if uh, from starting from verse 35, Leviticus 25 verse 35, if one of your brethren becomes poor and falls into poverty among you, and you shall help him like a stranger or a sojourner, that he may live with you. Take no usury or interest from him, but fear your God that your brother may live with you. You shall not lend him your money for usury, nor lend him your food at a profit. I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. I'll, I'll change it to Elohim for you guys, uh, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to give you the land of Canaan to be your Elohim. And if your brethren by you becomes poor and sells himself to you, you shall not compel him to serve as a slave. As a hired servant and a sojourner, he shall be with you and shall serve you until a year of Jubilee. Uh, by the way, I'm, I'm reading uh, from the New King James for those who were curious. Uh, and he shall depart, then he shall depart from you, he and his children with him, and shall return to his own family. He shall return to the possession of his fathers, for they are my servants, whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. They shall not be sold as slaves. You shall not rule over him with rigor, but you shall fear your Elohim. And as for your male, and as for your male and female slaves whom you may have, from the nations that are around you, from them you may buy male and female slaves. Moreover, you may buy the children of the strangers who dwell among you, and their families who are with you, which they beget in your land and they shall become your property. And you may take them as an inheritance for your children after you to inherit as a possession. They shall be your permanent slaves. But regarding your brethren, the children of Israel, you shall not rule over one another with rigor. 
Now, if a sojourner or stranger close to you be becomes rich, your brethren by him becomes poor and sells himself, uh, and your brethren by him becomes poor and sells himself to the stranger or sojourner close to you or to a member of the stranger's family, after he is sold, he may be redeemed again. Um, and it talks about the, the year of Jubilee, so I won't read the rest of that. But then it says, he shall be with him as a yearly hired servant, and he shall not rule with rigor over him in your sight. And if he is not redeemed in these years, then he shall be released in the year of Jubilee, he and his children with him. For the children of Israel are servants to me. They are my servants whom I brought out of the land of Egypt. So one interesting thing is that the New King James, when they translate it, they'll translate it in some passages as slave and in other passages as servant, even though the same Hebrew word, the same Hebrew word is behind both. So slave and servant both are rooted in the same Hebrew word, obed. And yeah, it means to serve. So according to this passage, what we've read is that you can... And a fellow Israelite, two Israelites, uh, basically, an Israelite can have an, an Israelite slave, but that slave must be a temporary slave and uh, kept in accordance with the Jubilee uh, requirement. So that no more than 50 years, um, and it's less than 50 years uh, typically, uh, because it says in the passage that once once you get the slave, it's you you uh, the slave belongs to you until the next year of jubilee. Uh, so so this suggests that it's a temporary thing, and you should not treat him as a a uh, a, a full slave in the biblical sense of a slave. Whereas it says the Bible sense of a slave, you can have those from the nations around you. This is, again, speaking directly to Israel. It suggests that Israel can, can buy slaves from the other nations and that they can inherit them as possession to their descendants. So that's a very problematic passage that sounds like wait a minute is the bible supporting actual slavery this is a concern so ways to approach this passage are well we you know we could just say maybe that's a corruption that that wasn't part of the original scriptures but that seems to ignore the historical context of the people so we don't want to say that because a passage disagrees with a modern concept that it must not have been authentic and it must be added by scribes. It's very possible that the passage in the Bible was original and it could still be horrible. The passage of the Bible could still be horrible because it was written by, by men. The, the scriptures were written by men and compiled. So in their original form, it could have had these, these horrible passages or these apparently horrible passages. So we don't want to rewrite the scriptures to fit it with the modern concept. That's imposing a modern understanding into an ancient text, which is questionable at best. So the other way to approach it is either, as we said, either this could be a immoral passage of the Bible, or perhaps, as I suggested, that the concept of slave was a little different. Um, another thing is connected to this issue is the issue of animals, having animals. You know, in our society, animals are very inferior. And even in the ancient times, it was also the case that animals were very inferior. But in the very ancient past, animals were much on a much higher level. The ancient peoples, they worshipped animals as gods many times. You know, the Egyptians uh, had a very high view of animals. Um, but Israelites also had a very high view of animals. Um, their scriptures speak of uh, respecting and honoring the rights of animals. And also the, the scriptures speak of animals being highly intelligent creatures, uh, very uh, much on a similar level and that of humans, and that they are essentially moral beings as well. There's evidence in the scriptures that they were moral beings. 
and that they could uh, know the creator, that they could have access to the creator and pray to him and commune with him, just like humans can. So uh, this understanding that they had in the past gave them a greater appreciation of animals and they didn't, at least the original, the, the righteous patriarchs, they didn't treat their animals harshly. They loved their animals. They took care of them. Um, so the, the same would be the case for slaves. The, right, the righteous people of the, of the scriptures, they treated their slaves more like family. They didn't treat them as animals that could be used however they want to be used, like as we use animals in our modern times. The concept of how we use animals is very horrible in our modern time, and that's the same thing in the past. They, I mean, it's not the same in the past. It's um, in the past they uh, didn't they didn't uh, treat them in the way that uh, we treat animals today. They, instead, they treated them as part of the family uh, and to love and care for them. So that's an important distinction right there that we want to look into. And then. Um, And now, before we go to the next passages, we want to think about why. Why does it say that Israelites cannot enslave each other, but they can enslave Gentiles? Uh, one thing to keep in mind is, well, you could argue it is a, you could argue it is a racial thing, but I think there's evidence against that, and that is because anyone could become an Israelite, no matter what nation you, you or in what, what uh, race you were. So it's more of a national thing rather than a race because race and nation is not identical because, you know, American people who are American citizens, that's, uh, you could be any race and still be American citizen. The same applies to Israel. We know in the scriptures, a bunch of Egyptians joined and became Israelites. Um, and like Joseph, he married an Egyptian and their children were Israelites. So, um, so it's not a race thing, it's a national thing. And we know from scriptures that Israel was to be a holy nation. So, and a special people. Uh, so from the perspective of, of what scripture says, Israel was not allowed to enslave each other because Israel was set apart as holy. That's the only reason. If they hadn't been a holy nation, if they hadn't been chosen to be holy, they could have had each other as slaves. But because they were sanctified and chosen to keep the Sabbath and to uh, do the, uh, the temple holiness, all those things uh, led to the requirement that none of Israel Israelites be permanent slaves. Now, Okay, so I'm going to go to another passage now. So another one is in Job. We see, now this is before, Job we know was before Israel. So this comes from a perspective where his, Israel did not exist yet. He said, if I have despised the cause of my male or female servant when they complain against me. What then shall I do when L rises up? When he punishes, how shall I answer him? So according to Job, if he mistreats his male or female servant slash slave, since as I said, servant and a slave in the Hebrew, Obed, is the same, um, it says when they complain against him. So if, if his servants complain against him, he needs to uh, attend to their cause and listen to them and address their needs and concerns. If he despises their, the cause of them, he says that he will be punished by the creator. So that's an important concept that Job brings to the table, that uh, those who were enslaved, they have a right to, have, to bring up their cause and complain against their, against their master. And if the master refuses to comply, they are in violation. 
and they are not following the ways of the Creator. So a righteous slave owner uh, attends to the needs and concerns of their slaves, according to Job. Now, we see another very interesting passage that is quite different from a lot of slavery from other nations, including the past of our own. And that is Deuteronomy 23, verses 15 to 16. You shall not give back to his master the slave who has escaped from his master to you. He may dwell with you in your midst, in the place which he chooses within one of your gates, where it seems best to him. You shall not oppress him. So what this says is if a, a slave runs away from his master, you are not to forcibly return him. Let him stay with you. So this is a very interesting uh, thing uh, because in America, for example, if a slave ran away and, uh, and he was caught, there would be serious repercussions for him. He could be, he could be uh, I think, I could be wrong on this, but I think he could like get his feet cut off or his hands cut off. I don't know if that's true or not, but I thought I remember hearing that in high school. Um, but they would, they would be punished harshly. Whatever the punishment was, I know that they were punished when they, if they were ran away and they, they got caught. Um, and in a, uh, and in, um, in many ancient societies, I think, uh, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, the same thing applied where if a slave ran away, they were to be punished. But the Bible tells us the different, different approach. Oh, hold on one second. Anya, were you talking about in the Americas, if a slave ran away? Yes, yes. Uh, if a slave oh, yeah. ran in the Americas. Yes, a, a person that ran away in um, the Americas in slavery, they were usually burnt. Um, they could have limbs and arms and even genitalia cut off, and then they would be resold. Wow, that is horrible. Yeah, that, that this. Thank you for sharing that, Daniel. I appreciate it. Um, but so, from the Bible perspective, it says you shall not give them back. So that's a very huge difference because what it tells us is that if a slave was unhappy with his master, he could leave at any time and not be forced to stay there. And um, the reason why this may, the slave may not want to do this is because he still was a slave. He still didn't have the rights of a free man. And the rights of a free man uh, allowed him to do many other things. So he couldn't do certain things because he wasn't free, but he could still run away from his master. Um, it's kind of like if you have a husband who is abusive. The wife can flee from an abusive situation. She shouldn't divorce him. From what, from what I understand, the scriptures suggest that divorce is very limited and only for uh, adultery. Uh, but she doesn't have to be forced to stay in a dangerous situation and live with him. So if he is being a uh, hostile to her, she has the right to leave until it's safe to, for her to return. So in the same way, you know, a wife can leave, but it doesn't give her the right to then sleep with someone else. But she's protecting herself because she doesn't want to stay in that dangerous situation. And according to the scriptures, the husband was very much considered the master of the wife. Again, that conflicts with the modern understanding of, of marriage. But, um, but what is interesting is the, the word uh, on that whole topic of, of, of uh, the husband being the master of the house, the head of the house, what's interesting is that the word husband literally means master of the house in English. If you go back to the old English, husband actually comes from the, the root house bond, and uh, it means the, the master of the house, house master or house bond. And then over time, the pronunciation changed. I mean, it wasn't originally house in pronunciation, pronunciation, but it was a slightly different pronunciation. Um, but then it, uh, 
became what it is today. And now we don't, we don't understand the connection to the house anymore because it just, we just see Hus, H U S and Oh, okay. It's husband, whatever that means. But in the past, whenever that word was used, the ancient, uh, the, the middle aged people who spoke English, or old English, they understood whenever they heard the word husband, they were hearing house master. They were hearing husband, house bond, or, you know, the, the one who binds, uh, binds the family together and uh, is, the, is the one who has the control over the house. So that is what literally, whenever you say husband, that is literally what you're saying, which is just kind of funny. But uh, so in the same way that a wife could leave her abusive husband for a time because she's being mistreated, the slave had the same right to leave the slave master. They the slave would not get the rights of a free man, but they're given the the benefit of the doubt. If you have a good slave master who's taking care of you, why would you leave that master? If the, if your master is giving you sufficient food, uh, clothing, and is not being and, and shelter, and is not being harsh with you, is not being overly harsh, but is giving you a good life, you have no reason to leave. The only reason you leave is if your master is hurting you and abusing you. Uh, so it says he can dwell with you in your midst in the place where he chooses. So he has the right to choose wherever he wants to, to flee to. And then we, it says where he, where it seems best to him. And it says, you shall not oppress him and he, and he may dwell with you. So it sounds like it's saying if he wants to live with another person, that person should be gracious and take them in uh, and shelter them and take care of them. So in the context of a modern concept you know if if a random person shows up at the door and, and asks for help and says i need a place to stay can you please help me you could turn him away and say well i don't know this person this is a stranger uh he's uh, you know he could be a crazy person i don't want to help him at all but from the bible perspective you know if, if someone comes to dwell with you you are to try to help that person it's the same thing where it says in the scriptures of if an animal you don't know who the animal is, belongs to and the animal walks up into your property or walks in your midst, you were to take care of that animal as your own until you can find who the owner is. So we have a duty to our fellow man to take care of them and to protect them from abuse. So this is a, another uh, insight that the scriptures have about slaves, that they have the right to flee and live wherever they want. That's definitely not in line with most understanding of servitude. Then we see is Proverbs 17 and it says a wise servant will rule over a son who causes shame and will share an inheritance among the brothers. So what this tells us is that servants can receive, or slaves can receive an inheritance. That also seems foreign to the concept of slavery. But according to the scriptures, a slave can receive inheritance. And that is supported also in Genesis, where we see Abraham is complaining and says, who will receive my inheritance? I, don't have, no, I have no sons. The only one who will receive my inheritance is my servant. Uh, I forget the servant's name, but that is found in Genesis. So Abraham was going to inherit, if he had no sons, he was going to inherit, uh, give an inheritance to his servant, one of his chief servants. So we do see this concept of servants slash slaves having access to inheritance and basically being treated as part of the family. Proverbs 22 and this is probably a concept that you guys can relate to in modern society. It says, The rich rules over the poor, and the borrower, the borrower is servant to, to the lender. Um, I, just, I just saw a, uh, 
I just want to uh, address, ask the question, because Governor, you said that is true. I didn't see what you said that to. You want to specify what you were saying that to? About slavery. W which thing in particular, though? That About what happens to slaves when they escape. Oh, yeah. Thank you for uh, commenting on that. Uh, yeah, so the passage that I just read from Proverbs, it tells us that if you are a borrower, you know, if you borrow money, you're a slave to your lender. And that's very much our society. We are uh, a society that is enslaved because we have so much debt in our society. So, you know, we all have mortgages, uh, not we all, but many of us have mortgages. We have car payment, you know, car loans, uh, credit card debt, all these things. Well, according to the Bible, that makes us a slave. We are a slave to our lenders. So that's also an important concept of how the Bible views slavery. If you are in debt to someone, that makes you a slave. Then Proverbs 30 tells us, uh, while, while I'm uh, looking this up, uh, can you guys tell me what the, uh, like, when do you guys have your next event? Because if I don't have much time left, I can try to skip ahead. Are you talking, are you talking about um, when you say our next event, what do you mean? Um, like, I know sometimes in the past I've done these teachings and then I've, I've had to go because you guys had an event uh, coming up. Like right, like at two o'clock, like a, a meeting or something. Uh, you're good until let's see. I lunch is at one, and our next event is until two. Okay, so yep. All right, thank you. So I, I still have some time. Like I, I, th I was concerned that I might have to end at twelve thirty because I'm not sure if I can wrap it up then. But I can definitely wrap it up before one o'clock. Um, so Proverbs thirty says. Do not malign a servant to his master, lest he curse you and you be found guilty. Again, this is in favor of, of, the, of the slave slash servant. We should not malign them. And, okay. Now, I'm going to read uh, Exodus 21. Not the whole chapter, obviously, but there's a few things it says about slaves. Okay. So here's a interesting uh, passage, which like. From the looks of it, sounds very horrible, but I believe it's a bad translation issue. And there are many times where translation issues completely alter the sense of the passage. So the first, uh, it says, if men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or with a fist, and he does not die but is confined to bed, if he rises again and walks about outside with his staff, then he who struck shall be acquitted. He shall only pay the loss of his time and shall provide to be thoroughly healed. And if a man beats his male or female servant with a rod so that he dies under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he, he is his property. On the surface, it sounds like it's saying, if a man uh, beats his servant and they die immediately, he should, he should be punished, but if they die only a day or two later, then he shouldn't be punished because he's his property. It doesn't make, it doesn't make sense. What the King, that's from the New King James that I read, and a lot of translations will read like that. But the, the King James, King James doesn't add all those extra fluff, and it, it sticks more to what the passage actually says. And also think about this, um, Onya. King James is writing in a format that will be used later on in the Americas to justify 
the cruel treatment of American uh, uh, transatlantic slavery. That's true. That is a good point. Um, yeah, because you know the, the King James is very popular. Uh, was was and still is very popular amongst uh, Americans, and as well, I think even uh, the English as well. So, in the King James, however, it says, "And if a man smite his servant or his." is made with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. Notwithstanding, if he continue a day or two, he shall not be punished, for he is his, prop, his money. So the King James says, if he continues a day or two, he shall not be punished. The New King James says, if he remains alive a day or two, he shall not be punished. That's a very different translation. If he continues versus if he remains alive. It's clear by context from my perspective, from the King James, that it's not talking about if he remains alive a day or two, but if it's in, in the very previous verse, it talks about a free man being confined to his bed. And if he rises and is, he, uh, he should be paid for a loss of time and the person who hurt, who injured him, should provide for him to be thoroughly healed. The same as being applying to the, the servant here. So it says if he remains, uh, if, he, if he continues a day or two, he should not be punished. What it's saying is if a servant is confined to his bed for a day or two and then is fully healed and can start working again, he should not, the, the, the master should not be punished because... Um, what the servant may be being called to do is sometimes extreme labor. Sometimes, you know, I, I uh, worked on a farm uh, in 2016 at the Weigel's place, and I was compensated with room and board. He worked me hard, and I was very exhausted. Sometimes my whole body was extremely in pain because I wasn't used to that type of labor. Um, but he wasn't abusing me. He was just putting me to work. A slave in the Bible concept can be put to work. And sometimes when you're putting them to work, you may cause them physical injury. Um, that's, if, if your servant is, works very hard and is exhausted physically, then uh, you know, they are confined to their bed. But if they recover, that's just part of the job. They, they worked a little bit too hard and uh, they got sore. But when they recovered, they were put back to work. They're not to be punished because that's the nature of their job is to uh, is to um, be put to that strenuous labor. But if you're fighting, if you fight with a uh, no, notice, it says in verse 18, if men contend with each other and one strikes the other with a stone or a fist. But then it says, if a man beats his male or female slave with a rod. So it doesn't say if a man beats his male or female slave with his fist or strikes them with a stone. It specifically specifies a rod. So what it's saying, a rod was used to, um, a rod was used to get them back to work. Similar to like with a horse. You know, a horse, uh, when you're riding a horse, there's a little uh, snapper thing, whatever you call it, a, sort of like a rod where if the horse is going off track, you give it a slight little tap, which, you know, it might sting a little bit, but it's not designed to uh, permanently injure the horse. It's just designed to put the horse back on track. Um, so the, the, the slave had the, uh, the, the master, had the authority over the slave to make sure they're doing their work. He did not have authority to just hit him with a stone and, or his fist. And, you know, that wasn't what this passage is referring to. Um, so, this, but this, so this says that if he kills his servant, then he, uh, he, then he is to be punished, which he doesn't say how he is to be punished, but the implication is if he kills his own servant, uh, then he may need to be put to death. It doesn't explicitly say that, but it allows for that possibility. Then we see 
in the same chapter, if a man strikes the eye of his male or female slave slash servant and destroys it, he shall let him go free for the sake of his eye. And if he knocks out the tooth of his male or female servant, he shall let him go free for the sake of his tooth. So that means if, if you abuse your slave to the point that you permanently injure them, you have no right to be their slave owner and you must free them. That's very, again, very different concept from the Bible concept. I, excuse me, from the American concept. Sometimes I misspeak, uh, sorry about that. But um, yes, yeah, so the, the concept is quite different because uh, this concept of if, if you, if a master permanently injures in any way, either the eye, tooth, or one of his limbs just permanently injures him, you, that man no longer has a right to enslave that person and he must let them go free because he abused his power and went too far. Um, so that's another protection for slaves that, that American slaves did not have, as far as I understand. I'm not an expert on American history or law. But then we see if an ox kills someone, the owner of the ox should be put to death if the ox uh, was known to be violent and the owner didn't do anything about it. However, if the ox kills a servant, then uh, the master is not to die, but the owner of the ox is not to die, uh, but is just to pay 30 shekels. So, but in, in, every, in every instance, the ox is to be killed, put to death. So in this passage, animals are inferior to all humans. So if an animal kills a, another human, especially an animal that is a, a pet or a owned animal, that animal is to be put to death. So no matter, in, in every instance in this chapter, the ox that killed the person is to be put to death. Um, even if it's a servant, the ox is to be put to death. But the owner of the ox is not to be put to death if the ox kills a servant, even though the ox is to be put to death because, well, it doesn't say why, but my theory is that, um, you know, the, the, the slave, because he's under the, uh, he is under the, um, The jurisdiction of his master, and if and if the slave is leaving his master and going about where he's not supposed to be going, the servant shouldn't be around that that uh, ox on his own on his own um, initiative. And then also, a slave might have a job duty to. Um, to take care of the, of the ox. Uh, like one of the duties of some servants slash slaves is to take care of animals. And sometimes those animals can be very dangerous. You know, like when you go to a zoo, again, employees, employees are very similar to servants. There's a contract and they, and they are, uh, as long as they're at their job, they are to obey their boss. You know, when I, when I go to my job at, I pretty much have to do whatever my bosses say, as long as it you know, doesn't go against uh, the law or anything like that. But I pretty much bend over backwards for my bosses, my bosses and superiors, because I try to do what they tell me to do, whatever it is. If they, if they tell me, stop doing this, go to something else, I do it, no questions asked. Or I might ask a question to understand, what do you want me to do? But I don't object to it because I just follow what I'm being told because that's my duty as my role that I was hired for. So when you have people in a zoo, for example, or a, a park who are taking care of animals, like a lion, well, that's a very dangerous job. Or if you have a, a ox that's out of control, you might need a servant to try to calm down that ox or a, an employee to calm down that animal. And that's a very dangerous job, but the, that's the duty that is assigned to the servant 
or employee. So if they die on the job, that was a dangerous job, but they needed someone to do that dangerous job. And a slave is someone who is able to do that type of job. So I think those are the types of reasons why I think uh, slaves were not to be, to be uh, if they were killed by an ox, that the owner was not to be put to death, the owner of the ox, uh, because the servant was liable to more dangerous types of, uh, because he was a slave, he was subjected to more dangerous types of work. That's why, why I think it has that uh, specification there. And, okay. So then, now another one is uh, Leviticus 19, verse 20, and it says, Whoever lies carnally with a woman who is betrothed to a man as a concubine and who has not at all been redeemed nor given her freedom, for this there shall be scourging, but they shall not be put to death because she was not free. So normally if, you, if a man lies with someone, with a woman who's betrothed to another man, that's considered adultery and both are to be put to death if they were both consenting to it. They are both to be put to death, according to the Bible concept. But in this case, if the woman who is betrothed is not a free woman, but is still a slave, there is not to be a, uh, there is not to be uh, the death penalty. And the reason for that, from my perspective, again, is that, um, like, normally from the Bible, you have, if a father gives away his daughter, and is being betrothed to another man, they're already in the process of engagement. They're engaged already. So if you uh, sleep with the engaged woman, that's adultery. You are uh, going against the contract. But in the case of a woman who's enslaved, she can't be engaged yet because she's still in a binding contract. She's enslaved still. So she still has a master. And so once she's been freed, then she is able to be engaged because as long as she is a slave, she can't be betrothed yet. Uh, she can't be received as an engaged woman. But once she's free from that, then she can begin the process of, of engagement and become a wife or concubine. So um, that again is, is explaining the, a nuance there of this issue. Now, then we have uh, Deuteronomy 5, which is, I believe it's the, yeah, it's the Ten Commandments. And it says, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife. You shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, his male servant, his female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. So in this passage, we, we see the concept is, a servant is considered one of his part of a man's property, but so is his wife, uh, his house, his animals, anything that belongs to him. So obviously a man should not abuse his wife and he should love her and take care of her in the same way. He should not abuse his servants either. Uh, and she, he should take care of them. So there's that context as well. Then we see a Exodus 12 tells us that slaves can keep Passover if they become circumcised. So it says, this is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat it, but every man's servant who is bought for money, when you have circumcised him, then he may eat it. So, and then it says, when a stranger dwells with you to keep the Passover, let all the males be circumcised and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as a native to the land. So if a slave or servant is bought for money and then he's circumcised, he becomes an Israelite. And so then he no longer is going to be a slave of, of the Gentiles. He's going to be, 
a Israelite slave. And an Israelite slave, as we discussed before, can't be made a permanent slave. He has to be ended. He can't be a slave once the year of Jubilee comes around. But so this shows that this allows for the pathway for slaves to become Israelites if they want. They, if, they, if they want to be, become an Israelite, they have that option. Another right to slaves is they can become an Israelite. They were also given the right uh, of the Sabbath. Uh, slaves were not to be put to work on the Sabbath. That's another important thing that must be kept in mind. Any holy day they did not have to work on. And then now I'm going to read two verses here. And it sounds like it's a contradiction. Um, this is Deuteronomy 24 and Exodus 21. And it reads, okay. All right, if, if, um, let's see. All right. It says in Deuteronomy 24, if a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren of the children of Israel and mistreats him or sells him, then that kidnapper shall die, and you shall put away the evil from among you. And if a man sells his daughter, uh, excuse me, wrong one, uh, he who kidnaps a man, this is from Exodus 21, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, or if he is found in his hand, shall surely be put to, put to death. So you see the difference there. In Deuteronomy, it says, if a man is found kidnapping any of his brethren of the children of Israel, he should be put to death. But it says in Exodus, if, a, if he kidnaps a man and sells him, then he should be put to death. So Deuteronomy makes it sound like only this only applies to kidnapping an Israelite and, and selling him. He should be put to death. And uh, Exodus 21 makes it sound like it's if, if you kidnap any man. How do we explain this contradiction? Well, there actually is a very amazing explanation to this, and that is, once again, textual criticism comes to the rescue because in the Septuagint, it agrees with Deuteronomy. The Septuagint of that same passage says, pull it up here. Um, let me see, what verse was that? 16, okay. So the Septuagint says, um, whoever shall steal one of the children of Israel and prevail over him and sell him, and he be found with him, let him certainly die. So, Again, Masoretic text says, he who kidnaps a man and sells him, shall, and, or, or who, if he is found in his hand, shall, shall surely be put to death. Septuagint says, whoever shall steal one of the children of Israel and prevail over him and sell him, and he be found with him, let him certainly die. So that shows that the original of Exodus agreed with Deuteronomy, and that there's no contradiction. So again, this is this concept of Israel is, a higher, is at a higher level. Israel is a holy nation. So if you kidnap someone and sell them, try to sell them into slavery, that is a violation of the holiness of Israel. And when you violate the holiness, that is a grievous, a extremely uh, sinful uh, thing to do. And many times when the Israelites violated a holiness, uh, it led to the death penalty. So this is not saying that you can kidnap Gentiles and sell them into slavery. It's just simply saying that it's not, there's not a death penalty if you do that, whereas Let there is. Question. Let yeah. me ask you a question on you. Um, sure. Do you believe that the uh, captivity into Babylon ha was, had partially to do with that because they, as a nation, particularly in, Ju in the uh, kingdom of Judah, had become literally lawless. And do you believe that 
slavery or selling their brothers into slavery uh, was part of that or no? Yeah, I mean, there's a um, there's a passage. There's some passages in like Jeremiah and Nehemiah, I think, which speak of how they don't they're not following the law and that they sell their they sell their fellow Israelites into slavery. I, I think there's certain passages that that suggest that. So I, I do think that very well may be that they were sent to Babylon as punishment for what they had done. You know, when when they sinned against their their fellow brethren. They were put, they were punished by going into exile. Do you believe that it went on during the second temple era where Jerusalem was sacked by the Romans, where these types of things were also going on? Um, I'm not sure the extent of how slavery was done in the second temple period. I would have to look more into that. But that is an interesting possibility. I, I do think the second temple problem that led to the destruction of the temple and the exile of Israel, I think that largely had to do with how they treated the Messiah when they crucified him. Um, I think that brought a judgment upon Israel when, when they did that. That's my take on why the, why the destruction of the second temple happened. You know, I, th I think it was very much connected with what they did to the Messiah. Um, so I'm going to I don't have much time left, so I'm just going to try to wrap wrap this up. Um, so I've covered pretty much the the Old Testament uh, passages, and now I'm going to briefly touch upon the New Testament passages. And I, I'm not going to read them all because, well, I'm not going. To, I don't think I even need to read any of them. Um, mm -hmm. You can look them up on your own if you want. But first of all, you know Mark 10 as well as other. The other gospel, uh, the gospel of Matthew, says, "If you want to be first, you must be a servant to everyone." Matthew says, "Servant to your brothers." Mark says, "A servant to everyone." It's an interesting difference there. But so we see that from the perspective of what of what the Messiah taught, he who's first to be last, who's la he who's last shall be first. So basically, the the Messiah made himself a servant and we should follow his role. So we should serve other people and we should behave as if we were servants and just help people. Uh, we should work for other people and try to, to help them. So that's an important thing there. Then we see that the Messiah says, if you are a sinner, if you commit sin, you are a slave to sin. And he wants to free you from that. So we are warned to not be slaves of sin. Paul elaborates on this uh, concept and says, speaks of slaves of sin versus slaves of righteousness. He says, you are a slave to whom you serve and to how you behave in your members of your body. If you commit sin, you are a slave to sin. If you commit righteousness, you are a slave to righteousness. So there's the two paths, life and death. Are you going to follow the path of righteousness, which is the path to life, or the path of sin, which is the path of death? If you sin... You are a slave to sin. To be free of sin, you have to be a slave of righteousness. So there's no middle ground here. You either are a slave of righteousness or you are a slave of, of sin. There's no not a slave of anything. Everyone is a slave, be they of, of sin or of righteousness. So from the Bible concept, everybody's a slave. It's just what does, a, what does it mean to be a slave? Certain types of slavery are one thing and, and another, another type of slavery is another thing. You know, there's the slavery, as I said, of only Israelites uh, where they are not to be permanently enslaved to, for labor. Then there's Gentiles enslaving them. They are permanently enslaved, but there are ways to, to free them from their slavery, and they are not to be abused, and they are to be respected as fellow people. Um, and then there's the slave enslavement, uh, as I mentioned, of debt, which Solomon spoke on. If you are borrow from someone, you are a slave to them. And there's uh, the slavery of your actions, where you, if you sin, as I said, you're a slave to sin. If you are not sinning, if you are a, perf a, a righteous person, then you are a slave to righteousness. Luke 16 says you can a, a slave cannot have two masters. I will he will be a, a slave of Elohim or of Mammon of wealth. 
or of sin. So are you a servant of the creator or a servant of the devil? Which are you? Um, so we're all, from the Bible perspective, we're all uh, slaves. And Luke 17 says, Luke 17 has a, has a parable where it says that a servant, when he does what his master tells him to do, the master doesn't say, thank you so much. Because the reason is because the servant, that was their duty. So he doesn't have a, he doesn't say, thank you so much for doing what you're supposed to do. You know, they, they are expected to do it. That's their, their role, their requirement. In the same way, we as followers of the creator are to be, uh, we have a duty to be righteous. Uh, so it's not, creator's not like, thank you so much. I appreciate you being righteous. He just commands us. That is our command. And we are to do that if we are a slave of our creator. So true slavery is following the creator uh, in his ways. And first Corinthians tells us this. He, first Corinthians tells us that our ultimate authority is the creator. He is our ultimate master. No one else is our ultimate master. So, um, so he says, let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called a slave? Do not be concerned about it. But if you can be made free, rather use it. For he was called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freed man. Likewise, he who is called free is Christ's slave. You were bought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Brethren, let each one remain with God in that state in which he was called. So Paul's telling us here, if you're a slave, that's an unfortunate thing. Um, uh, but don't, don't worry. Um, but if you can be made free, definitely become a free person. And he tells us why, though. If you're a slave, you're not really a slave. If you're a slave to another man, as long as you are ultimately a slave to your creator, you are the creator's, you are the Lord's freed man, he says. So you are free in, in the eyes of creator, even though you're a slave to man, you're actually free because you are not required to do everything that master tells you to do. You are to be righteous and follow the creator's ways first and foremost. Likewise, he was called free is, the, is Christ's slave so um a slave is free because he belongs to the creator and a free person is a slave because he is a servant of what the messiah commands of us and what the creator commands of us and he says you were bought at a price do not become slaves of men so he tells us become slaves of elohim or of the messiah so then also we see Galatians 3 and Colossians 3 tells us that everyone is the same in the Messiah, whether you're a male, female, uh, Israelite, Gentile, free man, or slave. There's no difference in the eyes of the Messiah. Again, a huge difference there. This tells us that uh, this is... Um, that in the eyes of Elohim, everyone's the same to him. So that's, again, a very huge difference. He, the creator sees them all the same. He loves us all the same. He accepts us as one body. So we should not treat those who are slaves poorly. And Ephesians 6 and 1 Peter 2 tells us, has the apostles telling us, uh, Paul and Peter, that is, telling us that... Uh, that a master is to uh, be respectful to their slave and a slave is to be respectful to their master. And um, then we have Paul saying in Galatians that a son, while he's a son and he's young, is no different from a slave. When he becomes an adult, he is no longer a slave. And John 15 says, he calls you friend, no longer a slave, no longer a servant, but he calls you a, uh, a friend. Um, but then he says a slave is not better than his master. Um, 
so these are all like different nuances where he says sometimes he calls him a slave, sometimes he doesn't call him a slave because there's different understandings here going on, different types of what it means to be a slave. So the final thing is um, all throughout the scriptures, the righteous have slaves or servants, you know, Abraham uh, and, and many others. Then uh, we see that nowhere ever in the Bible Old Testament or New Testament, but not anywhere in Yeshua's writings or the apostles' writings, does it ever condemn slavery and say it is wrong. Rather, it condemns a specific type of slavery, a corrupt, unjust slavery. So, it, as I said, this is a controversial concept, but I think from what I've perspected, it is a much more reasonable approach to what the Bible says about slavery. Whether you accept it as acceptable or not that's up to the discussion but uh it is a much better system to tolerate than modern slavery that we're aware of the corrupt slavery so from from what my final assessment here is that uh oh wait one, one other thing about i want i did want to touch on the dead sea scrolls uh there's only two small passages here first of all um well, actually, actually, just one. I'll just touch on the one. Uh, well, not. Okay, so the Essenes, I believe, wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some will dispute that, but if that is true, the Damascus document, once again, says servants and employees are not to do work on the Sabbath. So that, if that's written by the Essenes, that implies that they did allow for servants um, because they wouldn't say, don't have your servant work on the Sabbath if they didn't have servants. So the implication there is that they did allow for servants uh, in their writings. Then, in, also in the Damascus document, it says, do not sell clean animals or slaves in the covenant of Abraham to the Gentiles. So they had this understanding that the Gentiles were very evil with the animals and with Gentile, or excuse me, and with people, with slaves. So they commanded their Israelites, do not, do not sell animals or slaves that are in the covenant of Abraham to the Gentiles because they will treat, treat them badly. Uh, so with all that said, my, my assessment here is that slavery is, from the concept of the Bible, is a very much connected to poverty, those who are poor uh, and in need of uh, um, help, they can, they can sell themselves into slavery to uh, cover their debts, but also to not have to worry about responsibilities like house payments and things like that, they can be taken care of. And they can, and that they are part of the family and they are not to be treated as, as uh, worthless. They are to be treated as essentially equals. They're just a, a slightly different role in society, but just like women, you know, women, had different roles in the biblical society, but they weren't to be abused or hated or valued less than men. They were to be considered equals um, and cherished. And the ultimate goal, what the Essenes said, is that there's no property. And everyone shares everything. Unfortunately, we live in a world that's very difficult to happen. Um, but that's the ideal. The ideal is that Everyone loves each other. Everyone's at peace. Everyone is, everyone is sufficiently stable. There's no, the world we want to create is one where we don't need servants anymore. Unfortunately, in this world, we do need servants. Um, and we, we do allow servants in America, uh, certain types of servitude, but full blown slavery, we don't allow anymore. But, uh, in another, in most, most, uh, nations, you know, if you're obviously some people here might not be, Americans, uh, most of our modern nations have abolished slavery in the full form of slavery. Um, but eventually, you know, the goal eventually is for all slavery to be ended. Um, all slavery uh, from the concept of a slave master, but in the concept of, of whether you're righteous or not, uh, as I said, the scriptures divide everyone into two camps. You're a slave to righteousness or a slave to sin. And there's no other way around that. And, and that is the 
way for all of us. So we, we should all strive to uh, help people not be poor anymore. To free, we want to free people from their servitude, from their slavery, both their, their physical slavery, their financial slavery, as well as their spiritual slavery. The ultimate goal is for us to be free in all ways and a slave to the creator. That is our goal. Uh, so that's, that's my thoughts on the subject. Sorry, I went a little bit longer than, uh, but does anyone have any questions? And if you, if you do have questions, but not right now, you can always uh, message me on Facebook or, or contact me somehow. Uh, but yeah, do you guys have any questions now or are you guys hungry and you want to eat? <laughs> <laughs> I think that what they what we can do is if you do have questions for Onya, you can message him on Facebook and he will answer your questions promptly. Thank you very much, Onya, for joining us. Yeah, Shalom, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it was illuminating and helped clarify some things. Have a have a good lunch, guys, and I hope you guys had a wonderful Sukkot. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, y'all bless.